For there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group, meaning this, especially the religious people. They must be silenced because they are ruining a whole household by teaching things that ought not to be taught. And that for the sake of dishonest gain. Then verse 13 says, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in their faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or the commands of those who reject the truth. By the way, that's what religion does. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient. They're unfit for doing anything good. I just wish when Paul wrote, he would tell us how he feels, right? Like, yeah. like he just kind of, you know, always like, where are you, Paul? Like, no one knows where you stand on certain... So in those verses, what is Paul doing? He's stressing again and again that religion cannot produce a faith that leads to godliness. That only a life in Christ can do that. You know, religion emphasizes uh, this adherence to rules rather than an internal transformation that the Holy Spirit does. A couple of things he said, verse 10, it's just mere words. In verse 13, he said, it's faithfulness, but it's faithfulness to rituals. It's faithfulness to commands. See, here's the thing. Religion wants to use God. We're a relationship with God is falling more in love with Jesus. Religion uses God, according to verse 11, for the sake of dishonest gain. In religion, here's the thing. God is a means to an end. God's just the means to maybe more prosperity, maybe a promotion, maybe a passing grade. How many of us pray? Dear God, if you could just help me pass this exam. I'll go anywhere in the world, be a missionary. And, and then you get the result back. As long as it's, you know, like maybe a place like Creed, a private island. Like, I'll go there. We change that. See, God's just the means. Religion, in fact, leads to the opposite of godliness. Instead of service, instead of gratefulness, religion produces one of two things. There, there, there's two sides of the coin of religion. One is pride. That's probably what you hear more of. Most of the religious people in the Bible, they were very prideful. But the other side of that coin is this. It's despair. Religion takes you to a place where you go, I can't do this. Like, I can't live up to this. So those who excel at religion say, look at all that I've accomplished. By the way, look at how much better I am than you. Uh, And if you were to ask, why are you going to heaven? They would say, well, can you not see? Like, look at all of these good works. Look at all of my good deeds. Look at how good I am. Of course, if God's good and heaven's good, I'm good, I'm going to heaven. But that's religion. Because a relationship in Jesus says this. That there's no good thing inside of me. That that my heart is wicked. That the only way I can be right with God is because of the sacrifice of his son Jesus. Like that's it. That's a relationship. See, if we fail to live up the standards in religion, then here's what happens. You're going to fall into pride's evil twin brother. And it's that of despair. Oh, I'm just so terrible at this. I might as well just give up, go enjoy a sinful lifestyle. At least this makes you feel better, right? So so there's two sides of that. And then instead of producing godliness, both pride and despair, you know what they do? They actually produce more sin in us. So instead of full surrender, religion calls for like this partial commitment. And instead of hating sin... Religion says just negotiate with it. And your concern with sin is to basically just avoid God's punishment. So you ask, how close can I get and still be okay? That's the question of religion. Religion keeps you busy with its rituals and rules and commands. But religion never curbs sin. In fact, you know what religion does? 
It almost encourages it. But what about the gospel? You know what the gospel says? Not you should not. And I know many of you who grew up in church, that's all you ever heard. Thou shalt not, right? By the way, there were 10 of those. And all 10 of those was for your protection and for your provision. Matter of fact, let's just talk about one of them. Thou shalt not murder. Ooh, mean God up in heaven. Doesn't allow us to kill people. No, like that's for our benefit, right? To get along with people. So it's not you should not, but you need not. See, here's the cool thing about a relationship with God. You need not to get drunk because Jesus offers a better refuge than alcohol. You need not to lose your temper because God is in control of the situation. You need not to give yourself to the pursuit of money and riches because God is a better treasure. See, here's the thing. People who love God, they hate sin. Now, it doesn't mean that they don't sin, because you're always going to fight your flesh. But they're not concerned about how close they can get to it, because they hate it so badly, they want to stay away from it. And that's how people who love God feel about sin, because they know what it does to God. They know what it does to His glory. They know what it looks like for his son to be crucified on a cross. They know what it does to them. John Bunyan is usually attributed with this following statement. Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly, but then gives us wings. I'll take relationship with Jesus over religion any day. So in verse 16, notice what Paul says as we begin to wrap up. Paul says, many religious people claim to know God, but by their actions of the heart, they deny Him. See, here's the thing. The gospel isn't good advice. The gospel is good news. Like you don't have to do this on your own. Like God loves you and desires for you to give your life to Christ so that you can live this life in his power. It, it, it's not what I do or what I learn or what I experience that brings this new life. But it's beholding his glory. It's realizing what he's done for me. So considering that, right, Paul is going to urge us. I'm going to urge you, put your faith and trust in Christ. Don't put it in you. Because I'm telling you, as good as you may be, and some of you are really good, you're not good enough. None of us are. The Bible would say this, that no one is good. And I love this part. No, not one. Because there's a, always the one person in class that doesn't think the teacher's talking about them, right? Like, obviously, everybody else. That doesn't mean me. No, there is none good. No, not even one. Meaning, no, not even you, right? So put your faith, trust in a personal relationship with Jesus, not a man-made religion. 